raise our hand and respond to God. Respond to Him. Tell Him how truly grateful you are for all He has done for you. Oh, just tell Him. Tell Him. Tell Him how grateful you are for His kindness, for His mercies, for His generosity towards you, for His blessings. Even when you didn't deserve it, God still showed you mercy. Even when we have blown it over and over and over, He doesn't treat us according to the multitude of our iniquities, but according to the abundance of His mercy. Can we say thank you to our God? Oh, Father, we thank you. Lord, you are simply wonderful. There's no human words to qualify who you Father, we thank you. Thank you for your mercy. It is because of your mercy that we are standing bef before you. It is because of your mercy that we are alive today. Thank you for your mercy. Lord, let that mercy never cease from our lives. Oh, let the fountain of mercy, Father, be open continually over us. Lord, treat us every day according to the abundance of that mercy. Thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, we're going to continue on our topic that we started last Sunday on triumphant life triumphant life triumphant life but I want to take look at it from a different angle today I would like to look at the pleasure of the king that's the title if you want a title this morning the pleasure of the king the pleasure of the king and we'll read two passages the first one, we read Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. Judges 21, 25 in New Living Translation. And then we will read Genesis 22, just verses 1 to 3. Now, in Judges chapter 25, verse 20, 21, 25, he said, In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. In those days, they had no king. They had no king. And because of that, all the people, not some, all of them, did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Now, anytime you see yourself doing things that seem right in your own eyes, 
is an indication that you have lost sense of an authority over your life. You've lost that sense of an authority over your life. If you know that you are under an authority, there is someone you defer to. You can't do things just anyhow. You always consider that authority, whether it will go well, whether it will go down well with that authority or not. And so, because they had no king, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Hallelujah. Last week, I said, triumphant living starts when you begin to live every day to bring pleasure to your king. When you begin to live your life, you, you, con you give consideration. What will my king say? What will my king think? What will my king want? When these thoughts preoccupy your mind, then your life will now begin to gravitate towards living for that king. And we also said that when you become a captive of his pleasure, it now qualifies you to be led by him. And of course, that came from the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. The NLT, 2 Corinthians 2, 14, it talks about we being captives of Christ. He said, but thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us. He can only lead those who are his captives, who are under his authority, who have, you know, surrendered to him. You don't lead somebody that is not, is not surrendered to you. You, know, you will not. You know, there are some, some captives that they would rather die than for you to lead them as captives. Some warriors at the battlefront. When they see that, you know, they have no chance. Some of them. That was what happened to Saul and Jonathan. He said, instead of these uncircumcised Philistines to capture me, I would rather die. So he fell on his sword. He killed himself. He committed suicide. Praise God. So, but when you see a captive that is being led, that captive is, has surrendered. So, Jesus said, if you want to live a triumphant life, you must surrender yourself. You must be a lawful captive. In fact, that scripture that we used to quote, I think in the book of Isaiah, it said, even the lawful captive shall be what? I think we need to investigate that scripture very well. Captives of who? Hallelujah. So, we are saying this morning that for you to qualify to be led in triumphant procession, you must be a surrendered captive. And captive of what? Captive of his pleasure. For that for when that begins to happen for you, your life now comes into alignment with, with his divine purpose and plans. And we said, when your life aligns to his internal purpose, your realities becomes his responsibility. Okay? Because most times when message is going on, what goes on in our heart is, okay, so how does this message identify with my reality right now? I don't have food in the house. So what is the connection between triumphant living and food on my table? Right? You say, okay, I am sick in my body right now. So, what is the connection between what you are preaching and my sickness? Hallelujah. And we said, or rather I said, 
that when your life comes into alignment with purpose, your realities becomes his responsibility. Meaning, God will begin to take care of the things that you call your realities. And that's what Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He said, your realities are the things the Gentiles are running after. Because you live in the same world with them. What to eat, what to wear, what the cloth, the house to live in, the car to drive, the woman to marry or the man to marry, the babies to have. These are the realities that the Gentiles are also struggling with. But he said, look, it is not your responsibility to pursue, you know, after those realities. Let your life align with my purpose and my kingdom, and then your realities becomes my responsibility. He said, all these things will be what? Added unto you. You know, that's where we miss it. That's where many of us miss it. And we keep chasing after the realities. And it's like, you know, somebody chasing, chasing shadows. We never get all of them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There are some of us today that are seated here. That our life is on hold. If our life has been packed. You know a car that is packed? Motion is not moving. It's just on standstill. There are some people that their life is on hold. And the reason why their life is on hold is because God wants to bring that life into alignment. You don't do alignment to a car that is on motion. You have to park the car before you do alignment. So there are some of you God has parked you because you want to align your life. And, you know, some of us, we are struggling to, to, to move. When God is saying, no, don't move because if you move, a car that is not aligned will not go straight. It will, it will take a detour. It will move towards uh, the bush. So instead of you moving and then ending up somewhere that you don't like, allow me to bring your life into alignment. But some of us are struggling with God. Hallelujah. And when you allow God to align you properly, you move in the direction of your destiny. And you move in the direction of fulfillment. Praise the Lord. So, this morning, like I said, we are looking at pleasuring the king, the pleasure of the king. And rather, that is one of the most important pursuit in life, to pleasure the king. Because it's, it is in trying to pleasure the king that your life comes into alignment. I will explain. Everything about us, everything about our life is actually created to give the king pleasure. Right? Because somebody may ask, why is it important for me to pleasure the king? Why is it important? The truth is that you were created for that purpose. That is the purpose God created you. To bring pleasure to the king. Look at the book of Revelation chapter 4 verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, to receive honor, for you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. The, I mean, give it to us in King James. I think he put it differently. Aha. Uh -huh. He said, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created some things. And is it all? Is it all things? For thou hast created all things. Does that include you? Does that include your wife? Does that include your business? Does that include your children? Does that include every pursuit of life? For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Everything you see in this world that was created by God, the singular purpose of creating such thing is that God may find pleasure in it. No wonder the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will do what? You have desires. You have expectations. And he said, the way to finding 
those desires, those expectations, is when you pleasure the king. Delight yourself in him. Let him be happy with you. And he will grant you the desires of your heart. Somewhere God said about David. You know, it was David that was, you know, telling his, his brethren. He said, the reason why God chose me above my brethren and made me king over his people is because he liked me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He said, because he liked me. It's because he's, he's pleased with me. It's because, you know, he's happy with me. He liked me. No wonder God said he called him a man after his own heart. David wasn't perfect. You don't need to be perfect for God to like you. Hallelujah. In fact, there is none of us that is perfect here. But you need to move in the direction of his will for God to be pleased with you. Are you with this morning? Praise God. So, why is it important to pleasure the king? Number one, you are created to give him pleasure. You are created for that. Everything you are and you own is meant for his pleasure. Everything you are and everything you own. Look at the book of First Chronicles 29 verse 16. First Chronicles 29 16. Quickly. He says, O oh Lord, our God, this is David, all this store that we have prepared to build a house for thy name, come it of thine hand, and is all thine. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in my uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. Verse 18. O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Isaac our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. Praise God. This is David. He said, everything we own, everything that, you know, he was talking about the, the, the preparation for the building of the tabernacle. He said, what we have given you and what we own, everything belongs to you. And it is, you know, for your pleasure that, you know, those things were committed into our hands. Praise God. Another reason why you pleasure the king is that only what pleasures the king will pass his test. Only what pleasures the king will pass his test. Right? In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, it says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. To do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin, you did not desire, no hard pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. Any sacrifice that is done, that does not conform to the will of God, God will have no pleasure in it. And that is why I said, the reason why you pursue his pleasure is because only what brings pleasure to him will pass the test. Only what you do, that pleasure the king will pass his test. Just imagine, you do all the work, all the sacrifice, all the, and then, God will look at it and say, sorry, it does not pass the test. What it means is that your, all your labor is in vain. Hallelujah. All the labor will be what? In vain. Another reason why it is important to pleasure the king is that you can only fulfill his purpose for your life and experience the life Jesus promised you when you give him what he wants. 
It is when you give him what he wants that he will now come into the fulfillment of his purpose. Jesus promised us a life of triumph, a life of victory. But to come into that, you must give him what he wants. That's what I'm saying. The book of Romans chapter 12 verse 1. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So when what you do becomes acceptable to God, then verse 2 becomes a reality. And what does verse 2 say? It says, and do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So when you do what is acceptable to God, your life becomes transformed, your life becomes renewed, and then you come into what is perfect will of God for your life. But until you do what is acceptable in verse 1, what is perfect for your life will not find fulfillment. Hallelujah. And that is why it is important to please the king. So we want now move on to how do we bring pleasure to the king? If it is important to please the king, how do we do that? How do we pleasure the king? Number one, obedience. Obedience. He says somewhere, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience. Obedience. There are some of us who spend weeks and weeks fasting and praying while we are living in disobedience. Praise God. I have known husband and wife that Outwardly, they will fast, they will pray, they will do all the, you know, activities. But when it comes to the injunction of forgiveness, that forgiveness was hanged on a, sh on, on a shelf. So just imagine, you're carrying this, I mean, unforgiveness in your heart towards your spouse. And you're doing 30 days fast. What again? All the activities, you know the activities we do in church. Praise God. Do you think that sacrifice will be acceptable? Obedience, he says, is better than what? Sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God asks you to go and do something. And then you look for a way to bribe God so that you won't obey his sacrifice. Will God accept what you are giving him? No, he won't. Praise God. So if you want to delight God, if you want to please God, you must be a man of what? Obedience. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 from verse 1. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Church, let me tell you something. Anything God asks you to do is a test. Because there are billion other human beings that would do that, thing, that same thing for him. So did you hear what I said? Anything God instructs you to do is a test. Because there are many willing people that are lying, that are on the queue, that will do that for him. So don't think you are special. He said, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called him. Yes, he replied, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. He didn't even tell him the mountain. He didn't give him the full details. He said, I will show you the mountain. Just go. And what happened in verse two, 3? 
the next morning. So in essence, when God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, go and kill him for me. Abraham said, yes, sir. Abraham said what? Yes, sir. Obey before, even if you have complaint, obey first. He said, yes, sir. God is looking for men and women that will say yes, sir, to him. Before they look for other reasons. Amen. He said, the next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood. So he prepared. He actually, in the heart of Abraham, that boy was dead. He prepared wood for a fire, for a burnt offering, and set out for the place God had told him about. I don't know where God is leading me, but I trust him. I don't know what God wants to do with my life, but I trust him. And he embarked on that journey. Ah, God is looking for such men that will obey him blindly. Hallelujah. Abraham has to let go of what was precious to him because God said so. Because God says so. There is nothing Abraham had that God does not have access to. There are some of us, you know, in church, there are certain things that if God touch today, you say, God, please don't touch this one. <laughs> this one is a no-go area. This one, please don't touch it. Don't go there. You can touch this, you can do this, but this one, please don't go there. Don't go there. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, obedience will make you to do what God wants you to do even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to sacrifice your son. Does it make sense? This is the son that God said is going to multiply you through. This is the son that God called a covenant child, a child of promise, a son that God asked you to leave your country, to leave whatever thing you are doing and go to a place he will give you that son and through him he will build a nation that will bless the entire earth and then God will now ask you to go and kill that son. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And every day God gives us instruction that doesn't make sense. It takes people that are pursuing God's pleasure to obey him and carry out those instructions that doesn't make sense. Brethren, every morning, every afternoon, every night, God is giving instructions to his children that doesn't make sense. But not everyone will obey. Hallelujah. Come to think of it, sacrificing Isaac. I remember when we were building this place. One day, the founding pastor stood on the altar and he was crying. How many of you remember that? He wept when God asked him to sacrifice his Isaac. Amen. He has given several things, but that thing was, uh, you remember the Honda pilot? <laughs> they just brought him from America, you know, American spec. He was going to enjoy his car. And as he stood on the pulpit, I think downstairs there. Yeah, we're downstairs. God said, give this your Isaac. This car, you're not going to drive it. It's meant for this work. And the senior pastor broke down. The founding pastor broke down on the altar. You are crying. God, I'm willing. I will let go. You know, there are a lot of things that God asks us to do that doesn't make sense. Of course, some of us, we saw that, and we were moved. I remember I was also, that was, uh, it was my first car. Some of us, something starts very late for us. I didn't know how to drive until I was around 38. And it was at that age that even took me to go and teach me how to drive. We, we had a bus then, and uh, it was a crazy thing we did. We went somewhere, I don't know, Area 10. Went to Area 10. And as he was about to, we're, we're supposed, I mean, about to start the, 
the driving lesson. Somebody came, hey, 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 you can't, you can't do this in here. So they chased us out. So what do we do now? I told Adedeji, I must drive this bus. I said, give me, just, just shift. And I sat down. Do you know that I drove that bus from that, uh, it was my first time, and I drove it by faith. And Adedeji was strong enough to believe God <laughs> with me. We dropped that bus. I was praying, God, let all the traffic light be green. Because, <laughs> because I didn't know how to apply brake and to change from the clutch to the brake. <laughs> so the car must just move. So that's how we drove. It was crazy. But we drove and then we, I, I arrived at the number 133, uh, Yakubu Gawan. That's where we were renting. So that was my, my one and only drive, driving lesson. And then God sent somebody, he blessed us with a car. I can't forget, we were going for Bible study that evening when the gentleman drove the car into the church. And said, oh, somebody came. Your car has arrived, your car has arrived. I didn't know anything about it. Praise God. And that was how we had our first car. And of course, Adedeja has already taught me how to drive, so I started driving. <laughs> driving it. I didn't drive it for just for a couple of months. When that experience happened in church, People started giving. People selling land. People donating land. I said, ah, we won't be left behind. No. We must also partake of this. And uh, we came and dropped the car. And we started trekking. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that there are instructions God will give you to carry out that doesn't make sense. But God is taking you somewhere. God is taking you somewhere. Hallelujah. And so God told Abraham, take your son, go and sacrifice it to me. And Abraham did. Now, it doesn't make sense to surrender your last meal to a prophet. Remember the widow of Zarephath? It doesn't make sense. She said she was cooking her last meal to eat and die. The prophet said, go and bring it. Let me eat first. It doesn't make sense. But thank God that woman obeyed. Thank God she obeyed. Many people miss God's kairos moment for their lives because the instruction doesn't make sense. They miss the opportunity, you know, of a lifetime because the instruction doesn't make sense. What pertains to your destiny most times will not make sense. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It doesn't make sense. When you have the opportunity to japa and God say, stay in the land of drought. Ask Brother Isaac. There was doubt in the land. And he said, woman, we must japa, we are going. And he packed his things. He wanted to travel abroad to Egypt. God said, don't go. Stay in this land of famine. It doesn't make sense. But did Isaac obey? He did. And his life was transformed. I don't know what would have, they would have collected his wife like they collected that of his father in, uh, if he had gone to Egypt. There are people that have japat and they have, they, their life, you know, became a regret. But if God is the one that in it, because God can also tell you to live where you are to another place. God is a God of locations. God can ask you to move. All right? There are people that God asked them to move. Jacob and his family, God, you know, allowed them to move. And they went as a small family and in the place where he took them to, to, they became a nation. So God can do that. But let it be an instruction from the Lord. All right? Why doesn't it make sense? It is because in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8, in easy English, you know, version. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This one says, my thoughts are not the same as your thoughts. The way that you do things is not the same as the way I do things. That is why it will make sense. The way you think is not the way God thinks. The way God does his things are not the way you do yours. So when God gives an instruction and you begin, you reduce that instruction to your level of thought, you miss it. That's why obeying God is by faith. It's not by sense. 
Obeying God is by what? By faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But obedience is the channel through which God's biggest and best blessings come to you. Obedience is the channel through God's biggest and best blessings comes to you. In that Genesis chapter 22, verse 15 to 18, he said, the angel of God spoke from heaven a second time to Abraham. I swear, God's sure word, because you have gone through with this and have not refused to give me your son, even when it doesn't make sense. Next verse. I will bless you. Oh, you know, when I read this translation, it's like the thing was sweet in God. He said, I will bless you. Oh, I will bless you indeed. Oh, how I will bless you. You know, he emphasized that blessing. I will make sure that your children flourish like stars. So the blessing is not only limited to the father Abraham, but his children and children's children will become partakers of the blessing. See, there are some obedience you carry out that will not, you know, uh, stop. The blessing will not stop with you. Your children and children's children will become beneficiaries of this obedience. He said, and I will make sure that your children flourish like stars in the sky, like the sun on the beaches, and your descendants will defeat their enemies. Verse 18, all nations on earth will find themselves blessed through your descendants. Can you see this blessing went beyond his family to the nations of the earth? Do you see what we miss when we disobey God? Because it doesn't make sense. I didn't finish the story of the car, giving of car. Praise God. A, a short while after that, we went, some, we went to Gudu Cemetery for a burial. And after the burial, a brother walked up to us. Of course, we, we drove, we went to Gudu Cemetery in a borrowed car. Somebody gave us a car because, so we drove the car, my wife and I, and one other person. Uh, Pastor Tony, those of you that remember Pastor Tony, we went to the Good Cemetery, and after the burial, we were just about coming out, the brother went and said, the Lord told me that I should not go home with this car, that I should give it to you. And it was a brand new Toyota Corolla that time. It was 2010. A brand new car. He said, the Lord told me not to go home with this car, that I should give it to you. So he handed the key and he asked, but I have to go home. So you guys have to go and drop me. So I took the borrowed car. I gave Brother Tony, please drive this car. Take it back to the owner of the car. Tell him that the Lord has visited us. My wife and I took the brother and went and dropped him in his office. And we went home with the car. Praise the Lord. Now, just imagine. When we were prompted, when we saw that outflow of generosity from the church, people were God, and we decided, look, this is our first car. We've never owned a car before. God, have mercy on us now. Allow us to. And we decided to, and you know, the car was Tokumbo, uh, to, uh, uh, Toyota Carina 2. Yeah? Just imagine if we kept that car. And you know, the beauty of it all is that it was Toyota Carina 2, and then when God was going to bring us into blessing, it was still Toyota car, Toyota Corolla. You know, you can't compare Toyota Corolla and Toyota Carina too. Praise the Lord. Obedience is a channel. Obedience is a channel. Abraham obeyed, and he went and sacrificed his only son Isaac, and God gave him descendants. God gave him nations. Out of that one Isaac that he sacrificed came out nations, came out descendants because he obeyed. Maybe if he had refused, he would have remained with just Isaac. What you don't sow, you don't harvest. Obedience 
is sowing. And when you do it, God will visit you. Of course, when you look at Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 22, it's a mirror of Romans chapter 12. Genesis 22 and Genesis, I mean Romans chapter 12, is like a mirror. Sacrifice and you come into perfect will of God. Abraham sacrificed and the covenant of that he told him in Genesis chapter 12 find, found fulfillment. God, you know, reenacted that covenant. He said, in bless, and he swore by, his, by himself, in blessing I will bless you and in multiplication I will multiply you greatly. Praise God. But there's one more that I will give you. Maybe you go and look at it. Faith, faith. Abraham's journey towards pleasing God was also based on trust. He trusted God. He trusted God. In Romans chapter 4, verse 18, 20 and 21, when everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would. And so he was made father of multitude, multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, you are going to have a big family. Verse 20. Abraham never withered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Verse 21. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Hallelujah. So, the faith of Abraham was also uh, the reason why his life pleased the Lord. His life pleased the Lord. And you see faith in all the actions of Abraham. When God said, leave your father, leave your mother to a place I will show you. Abraham lived. I mean, he, he left. Not knowing where he was going. That, that was an act of faith. When God said, take your son and go and sacrifice him to him. He didn't even consult with his wife. He took the son and went to where God told him. That was an act of faith. So Abraham's faith pleased God. And because of that, God brought him into the fulfillment of that plan that he asked for him. Abraham's confidence in God's promises and God's character were the secrets of his life. They were the secrets of his life. So in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, it, it, you know, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone that comes to him must believe that God exists, that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. In chapter 10, verse 38, he said, The just shall live by his faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Anyone that walks in doubt, anyone that turns away from faith, the Bible says he will take no pleasure in such person. Faith brings, you know, pleasure to God's heart. When people walk, relate with God based on faith, it brings pleasure to his heart. Hallelujah. In that same uh, scripture, 35, 36, the Bible says, cast not away your confidence because it has great recompense of reward. Your confidence in God, no matter what happened. And during the workers' prayer meeting this morning, Sister uh, Achamto was leading us to pray. And she said something very, very, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, significant. That people are going through a lot. Especially in this current season and dispensation. People are going through a lot. So there is a the temptation. You say, because I don't have enough, my service to God will now have to be, you know, suspended or I have to scale it down. Because when we, when, during the workers' meeting, the place was very scanty. Hallelujah. But I want to say here that it is even in times of difficulty, great difficulty, that your faith needs to come alive. Praise God. I did some crazy things, though. I did some crazy things, you know, through faith. How many of you know Ogba in Lagos? Oba, is it Oba? Uh -huh. In Ikeja, around Ikeja area. I have trade from Oba to Idimu. What is that? 
Is it far? I was looking for something. I had, you know, there was a program going on there, and I needed to go, and I didn't have money. I only had one-way transport. Of course, my wife had gone to work. I couldn't, uh, because then I was a full-time house husband. She was the one working. And I needed to go. I needed an encounter. I needed God. I was looking for God, you know, just anywhere. So I said, okay, the only way I can enjoy it is to go, and then maybe go to a miracle can happen. So I went there by faith. I, 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 I entered motor, I went. In fact, even offering, I didn't have. So after the meeting, and the meeting finished at about 10 p.m. And unfortunately, it started raining. And there was no money to go back. Praise the Lord. The man of God had to trek. I trek. I arrived home around 2 a.m. or about 3. <laughs> when I knocked, I entered like, you know, you know this chicken that uh, rain beat them. And <laughs> Praise God. No money. And then God, I heard that God is there. And I won't go. Praise the Lord. There are some crazy things you do. There are some crazy things you do because you are looking for God. Hard times are not the times you scale down on looking for God. Hard times are times you scale up. You scale up. You scale up. You don't scale down. You don't scale down. You scale up. I have trekked in that Lego zone. I, 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 you, this down story is for another day. There's no time for me to tell you. I, I trekked in that Lagos. If I trekking became pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> trekking became pleasure. Some of us, we learned how to fast, not because we wanted to fast. We learned how to fast because there was no food. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. When you are looking for God, there are some things that they don't matter. They don't matter. Those days, you can go long time without food and it doesn't change you just in fact you are enjoying god in the place of prayer it's one of the seasons in my life that i, I will never forget you need to see some of my journals some of the encounters that happen in those times see character is not built during comfort character is built on the ashes of trial There are things today that happens in my life. There are things today I, I, I can never see myself do them. Because God taught me character in those seasons of trials. Hallelujah. May the Lord help us. May the Lord grow us. May the Lord make our lives pleasurable to him. May the Lord make us men and women that are willing to go to any length to please this God. In the mighty name of Jesus, shall we rise as we pray? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, make me a man after your heart, oh God. I think that's the prayer we should pray. Make me a man after your heart. As simple as that. I don't know how. I don't know. I don't know how. But I want to be a man after your heart. I want to be a man after your heart. I know there are people in, the auditor and in this auditorium this morning that are crying that cry in their heart. God, make me a man, make me a woman after your heart. I know it doesn't look like it now. There are so many issues around my life. There are so many things that I'm grappling with. But God, my prayer this morning is that make me a man and a woman after your heart. Can, can somebody pray that prayer for himself? Make me a man, make me a woman after your own heart. A man that gives you pleasure. A man that everything about him, about his life, bring pleasure to you. Make me that man. Can somebody pray? Please pray. Can somebody pray? I didn't say you should keep quiet. I didn't say you should murmur it. I want you to pray. Let God hear you. And mean it. Please mean it. Victory is for those who give God pleasure. Triumphant life, triumphant living is for those who give God pleasure through their obedience, through their faith, through the fear of God. God told Abraham, now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you fear me. 
Abraham didn't even discuss the matter with his wife. He didn't, he didn't seek counsel from friends to obey God. You know, there are some of us, when God said we should do something, we now begin to ask people, hmm, did you hear? Uh, this is what I'm... I'm uh, you, we, we just want people, you know, perhaps to discourage us from doing that. But not Abraham. Early in the morning, he left to obey God. He obeyed God early. He didn't drag it. Lord, help us. Help us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Lord, I pray for this congregation this morning. One prayer for every soul in this place. Make us men and women that give you pleasure. Make us men and women that delight your heart. Make, a, make us men and women after your heart, O oh God. That's our prayer this morning. Yes, we may have issues around us. We may have things we are struggling with, we are grappling with. But Lord, our heart cry this morning is make us men and women after your own heart. Please help us, O oh Father. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. It's blessing time and offering time. My work has been so major.